I'm first publishing this video on October 12, 2020. Can you believe it's been 40 years since Gary Maddox snatched that Enos Cabell fly ball in center field, completing a Dick Rufin 1-2-3 10th inning, and thereby sending the Phillies to their first World Series in 30 years? Now, of course, we all know that that World Series ended a 97-year curse dating all the way back to the founding of the Phillies in 1883. 1980 was a year that Phillies fans had savored, just as Mike Schmidt told us to do back in the victory parade after winning the World Series. So it only seems appropriate on this 40th anniversary of the day that the Philadelphia Phillies triumphed over the Houston Astros that we celebrate what many still consider to be the greatest NLCS in Major League History. Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball History. On this channel, we talk about the history of baseball from the A's to the Phillies to the 19th century. And sometimes we talk about contemporary baseball issues. So if you love baseball and if you love Philadelphia, Stick around and subscribe to our channel. Show your hometown pride. Philadelphia baseball history merchandise. T-shirts, phone cases, masks, notebooks, mugs, and more. Check out the exclusive designs in our merch store and celebrate your favorite Philadelphia-based team. Nineteen eighty was a pivotal year for the Phillies. Postseason play, let alone the World Series, was never assured in that up and down season. If history had not gone the Phillies' way, nineteen eighty could have signaled the breakup of that team and initiated a new rebuilding process. One thing that is for certain is that the Phillies kept their fans on the edge of their seats for the entire season. The regular season, the postseason, they were all dogfights, closely contested challenges with the Phillies prevailing after showing focused tenacity. After struggling for decades to try to stay out of the National League basement, the Phillies organization began to get serious about becoming a contender and building from the ground up. Beginning in 1970, young, talented players began emerging from the Phillies farm system and playing in the big leagues. Larry Boa, got the Phillies' first hit in their new ballpark, Veterans Stadium, in 1971, and then scored the Phillies' first run. Soon, a power-hitting first baseman turned left fielder began giving the Phillies' faithful great excitement as he hit monster shots, sometimes reaching the upper deck of the vet. Because of his impressive strength, Greg Lazinski earned the nickname, The Bull. And Bob Boone? He was becoming the team's everyday catcher. Meanwhile, a new third baseman who was struggling in his rookie year soon proved that he should be batting in the heart of the order. Once Mike Schmidt got into his groove, the heart of the Phillies' homegrown office was now in place. The Phillies soon added young pitchers Larry Christensen and Dick Ruthven to their ranks. Although the Phillies did have to reacquire Ruthven after they traded him in order to acquire Jim Cott in their first playoff run of 1976. With the addition of Steve Carlton, who accounted for 46% of the Phillies' wins in his magical season of 1972, Gary Maddox and Tug McGraw, the Phillies had a nucleus of a competitive team and things began to play off. In 1976, the Phillies reached a franchise high of 101 wins, which was only surpassed in 2011. They had begun their dominance of the National League East and were only one game behind the Big Red Machine that year. But 1976 also began playoff disappointment. That 1976 team was swept by the Reds. 
and then they lost three straight National League Championship Series. Phillies management began taking more drastic measures, the most obvious of which was signing the biggest free agency prize yet, Pete Rose. It was thought that this hard-fighting veteran would help ground the young team that was in such need of leadership. They were a young, talented core, but they needed guidance. The Phillies also brought on board an all-star second baseman in Manny Trio, as well as a quality pinch hitter in Greg Gross. 1979 was the season that the Phillies went all in, which is why it was a major disappointment when the Phillies found themselves two games below 500 on August 31st, 1979. They decided to blame the manager, and Danny Ozark was fired. In the offseason, the Phils made very few moves, and it was clear that they were betting on the same core of players to break that 97-year curse. But the 1980 season was not going to be a cakewalk. The Phillies started off slow, and by the end of April, they hadn't even reached 400 yet. But by the end of May, the Phillies had climbed into second place, and they were just a game behind the defending world champions, the Pittsburgh Pirates. The NL East race that year was a dogfight, with only one game separating three teams for first place by the All-Star break. Those three teams? The Phillies, the Pirates, and the Expos. But after a lackluster July and a slow start to August, which included a four-game sweep in Pittsburgh, the Phillies found themselves six games behind the Pirates. The new Phillies manager was not going to sit idly by and watch as this core of talented players would collapse once again. Dallas Green was a sharp contrast to his predecessor. He was abrasive. He was not afraid to call a player out for not living up to his potential. He would bench star players who he didn't think was giving their all. It was a style that rubbed many, including Gary Maddox, the wrong way. But something had sparked the Phillies. By the end of August and in early September, the Pirates had fallen into a swoon. This included a two-game sweep at the hands of the Phillies in Philadelphia. And the Pirates continued to lose ground. By the last two weeks of the season, it had become a two-team race for the NL East. Montreal and Philadelphia. Going into that final three-game series in Montreal, the teams were tied for first place. This meant that whoever won the series would win the NL East, and it was on the back of clutch hitting of their star third baseman Mike Schmidt that the Phillies proved victorious. In the NLCS, the Phillies faced the Houston Astros. The Astros had to face the Dodgers in a one-game playoff in order to win the West, as the Dodgers and Astros had ended the season in a tie. And as we know, each game in that 1980 NLCS was hard fought. In a series that went all five games, four of those games were decided in extra innings. Game one saw Steve Carlton give up only one run, and that's when he ran into trouble in the top of the third inning. But the Phillies responded in the bottom of the sixth inning, with a two-run shot by the bull Greg Luzinski scoring Pete Rose, who had started off the inning with a single. The Phillies added an insurance run in the bottom of the seventh when Greg Gross knocked in Gary Maddox with an RBI single. The Tugger then proceeded to hold the Astros to no more runs. On to Game 2, which was the final game to be played in Philadelphia. The game itself was a heartbreaker, with the teams exchanging the lead three times. Then Gary Maddox tied it up at three with an RBI single at the bottom of the eighth. But in the 10th inning, reliever Ron Reed was charged with four runs. Kevin Saucier had to come in in order to shut down the Astros. And in the bottom of the 10th, 
Heat Rays RBI was simply not enough to overcome a four-run Astros lead. The series was now tied with three games to go in Houston. Game three was a pitching duel between the Phillies' Larry Christensen and the Astros' Joe Micro. And with no score after nine innings, the game went into extras. But Danny Walling then hit a fly ball to center field. It was deep enough to score the runner on third. In the bottom of the 11th, Tug McGraw gave up a leadoff triple. The next two batters then received intentional walks in order to set up a force at home plate. But Danny Walling then hit a fly ball to center field. It was deep enough to score the runner on third on a sacrifice fly. The Phillies were now down two games to one, and they could not afford to lose another game. And if the Phillies were going to win, they were going to have to do it in Houston's home turf, the Astrodome. Now the fourth game raised a bit of controversy. In the top of the fourth inning, Big McBride and Manny Trio both singled off of Vern Rule. Then Gary Maddox hit a line drive back to the pitcher's mound. At first, umpire Doug Harvey called it a trap. Vern Rule still threw the ball to first base in order to force out Maddox. But Harvey called the rest of the umpires together in a conference and as a result of that conference, reversed his call. It was now ruled that Vern Rule had caught the line drive and by throwing the first base, had doubled off Manny Trio. Meanwhile, Art Howe still had possession of the ball and he noticed that Big McBride had reached third base. He ran the second and apparently completed a triple play. And what followed was 20 minutes of arguing as well as with the umpires conferring with the NL president, Chubb Feeney, who was present at the game. In the end, it was decided that McBride had been confused by Doug Harvey's original call, and he was allowed to return to second base. But the double play stood. Both teams played the rest of the game under protest. However, Larry Boa then ended the inning with a ground out. Two fielding miscues by left fielder Lonnie Smith allowed the Astros to score their first run in the bottom of that inning. The Astros followed up in the fifth when Luis Pujols tripled and then scored on a single by Rafael Landestor. But the Phillies didn't give up. The top of the eighth inning opened up with the Phillies hitting three straight singles off of Rule. And the third by Pete Rose drove in Greg Gross. Rule was then replaced by Dave Smith, and Mike Schmidt hit a single off Dave Smith, scoring Lonnie Smith. Big McBride struck out, but Manny Trio hit a line drive to left field. Rose was tagging up on third base, and he scored the go-ahead run. Mike Schmidt, however, thought that the ball was trapped and was doubled up when left fielder Jeffrey Leonard through the first. The Phillies remained in the lead until the bottom of the ninth when Terry Poole singled in Landestoy off Phillies reliever Warren Brewstar. And once again, the teams were going into extra innings. In the top of the tenth, Pete Rose hit a one-out single to center field, but Mike Schmidt failed to drive him home, lining out the left field. Greg Luzinski then entered the game as a pinch hitter. The ball hit a double to left field. And ever the competitor, Pete Rose was not about to slow down. With the throw coming to home plate, Pete Rose bowled over Astros catcher Bruce Bochy and scored the go-ahead run. Manny Trio then doubled in Greg Luzinski to give the Phils a two-run cushion. And then in the bottom of the 10th inning, Tug McGraw came to the mound, and he retired the Astros in a 1-2-3 inning. The Phillies had tied up the series. The pivotal game five was played on October 12th. The Phillies put their rookie sensation, 
the pitcher of the month for September of 1980, Marty Bystrom, on the mound. Now, Bystrom and Bob Walk were only permitted to be on the Phillies roster because pitchers Randy Lurch and Nino Espinosa had suffered injuries. And in this Game 5, Bystrom faced baseball legend Nolan Ryan. Bystrom gave up a first inning run off a Jose Cruz double, but then buckled down and did not let the Astros score another run through five innings. Meanwhile, Manny Trio singled in the top of the second, followed by a Gary Maddox walk. Bob Boone then scored them both with a single to center field. Boone, a base hit center field. Manny Trio scores. Maddox is going to score, and the Phillies lead it 2-1. to one. So not walking Bob Boone. Cost Bill Verdon a couple of runs. A line single up the middle by Boone. And the Phillies took that one-run lead into the bottom of the sixth. The bottom of the sixth inning saw Denny Wallen reach first base on a fly ball error. And after Alan Ashby tied the game up with an RBI single, Dallas Green pulled his young pitcher. Marty Bystrom had only given up one earned run to this point. Warren Brewstar then came in and got Craig Reynolds and Nolan Ryan to fly out to end the inning. Now this being the fifth and deciding game, it was all hands on deck for the Phillies. Normally a starter, Larry Christensen came in the game in relief in the seventh inning. After a single, a sacrifice bunt, and an intentional walk, Christensen gave up an RBI single to Denny Wallen. And with Jose Cruz on third base, Christensen then threw a wild pitch to Art Howe. The wild pitch scored Cruz. Green replaced Christensen with Ron Reed. Howe then drove in Walling with an RBI triple. At the end of seven innings, the Astros were now ahead 5-2. But even being three runs down, the Phillies were not ready to roll over. Larry Boa, Bob Boone, and pinch hitter Greg Gross led off the eighth inning with singles to load the bases. Nolan Ryan then walked Pete Rose to force home Larry Boa. Joe Sambino came in to replace Nolan Ryan, and then the first batter he faced, Keith Moreland, grounded out for the first out. But on that ground ball, Bob Boone scored, and now the Phillies were only behind by one run. Ken Force then came into the game and got Mike Schmidt to strike out swinging, and with two outs, pinch hitter extraordinaire Del Unser then strode to the plate. Unser hit a single to right field, scoring Greg Gross. The Phillies had tied the game. Manny Trio came to the plate next. He hit a ball down the right field line. It stayed fair and was a bases clearing triple. The Phillies were now ahead by two. But of course, this wouldn't be 1980 if we ended the story there. The Tugger came in in order to try to hold the Astros in the bottom of the eighth inning. Tugger struck out two, but gave up two singles before facing Rafael Landestoy. Landestoy then hit an RBI single. This was followed by a Jose Cruz single, which also scored a run. When the eighth inning ended, the Phillies and Astros were tied once again. Although the Phillies started off the ninth inning with a leadoff single, and a successful sacrifice bunt to advance Larry Boa to second base, Greg Gross grounded out for the second out. Boa had advanced the third, but Pete Rose was intentionally walked, and George Vukovic came in to pinch hit for the tugger. Vukovic grounded out to end the inning. Again, it was all hands on deck for the Phillies pitching staff. Starter Dick Ruthven came in in the bottom of the ninth inning, in order to try to hold the Astros to no runs. He was successful in retiring the Astros in a 1-2-3 ninth inning. This game, indeed this series, was going to be decided in extra innings. Mike Schmidt started off the 10th inning by striking out, and Del Unser then hit a double. He was advanced to third base by a Manny Trio fly ball, and with two outs, Center fielder Gary Maddox came to the plate. Maddox 
doubled off of Frank Court and scored Unser. The Phils took an 8-7 lead. The Phillies were then retired when Larry Boa lined out the second. So the Phillies were taking a one-run lead into the bottom of the 10th inning, and they were relying on Dick Ruthven to keep the Astros off the board. The leadoff batter, Danny Heap, hit a pop fly to short, out number one. Terry Poole then lined out the center fielder, Gary Maddox, two away. And back in Philadelphia, the tension in the entire city was palpable. Phillies fans were glued to the TV, hoping for another chance to win the team's first world championship. By this time, the Phillies already knew that the Kansas City Royals were going to be their opponent. The Royals had swept the Yankees in the ALCS. So the Royals would be their opponent if the Phillies could just hold on. Now, Enos Cabell came to the plate, and he was not going to make this easy. Cabell worked a full count. And then, on the sixth pitch of the at-bat, Cabell hit a line drive to center field. The fly ball was right to the Secretary of Defense, Gary Maddox, who clutched the ball for the third and final out. The Phillies had done it. With Dallas Green leading the way, Gary Maddox was carried off the field in victory. The Phillies would get their chance to break that 97-year curse. Now, Venezuelan native Manny Trio posted a 381 batting average and had four RBIs in the NLCS. His relay throw in the fifth inning also prevented Lewis Pujols from scoring. On the strength of this performance, Trio was named the NLCS MVP. In a post-game interview, Manny Trio noted because Royal second baseman Frank White won the MVP award in the ALCS, Trio's wife had put pressure on him to step up his game and win the NLCS MVP. And thus ended what many still consider to be the greatest NLCS played in NLB history. Now, of course, the Phillies were not finished, but we will address the World Series in a future video. For now, please leave a comment of your memory of the 1980 Phillies. Maybe leave a topic that you'd like to see in a future video. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more stories of the great history of baseball in Philadelphia. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. If you have any ideas for topics that we can cover in the future, please let us know in the comments below. If you would like to see more of these videos, please consider becoming a patron through Patreon. Again, we'll have a link in the description box below.